By now, it's safe to say that there are few people on the planet who spend as much time thinking about the Russian Empire as Vladimir Putin, leaving those of us in the West either perplexed or amused. It's not that America, the United States, was going to launch a surprise strike on Russia. I didn't say that. Are we having a talk show or a serious conversation? <laughs> I mean, Putin has an obsessive interest in history, and I think it's pretty calamitous. I think the world would be in a lot better state if he had no interest in history whatsoever, because um, he, he has a particular perspective. He's very interested in history, by the way. Um, he, he, he's not a great reader. He's not, not, unlike Stalin, he's not at all interested in reading fiction, but he reads history books. and. He, um, he's very interested in the sort of in, in the great czars versus the, the bad czars of, of Russian history. As you know, some have called you a czar. So what? You know, people call me different names. <laughs> well, does the name fit? Kremlin spokesman quoted as saying, the president chased a particular pike for two hours before, of course, snaring it. His trips definitely have a recurring theme. In the past, we've seen him topless on a horse, rock climbing, even arm wrestling someone at a summer camp. The only question now is, should we be thinking about the Russian Empire too? Its story is stranger than any yarn of fiction I have ever come across. But if one follows the thread this empire left behind, it leads unmistakably to the war that rages on in Ukraine today. Though the empire's last czar, Nicholas II, was toppled over a century ago, the memory of Russia's imperial past has haunted the Kremlin's labyrinthine halls ever since, animating the likes of both Joseph Stalin and Vladimir Putin. At its peak, this ravenous Eurasian empire, destitute of natural borders, grew the population of 164 million, covering a sixth of the globe's surface. At 23 million square kilometers, or 9 million square miles, this empire was the third largest in history, trailing only the British and Mongol empires. And it was the Turco-Mongol, or Tartar hordes, along with the Byzantine Greeks, whose imperial enterprises most profoundly shaped the empire builders of Russia. These Mongol and Byzantine fountainheads yielded a kind of elixir of eternal conquest. They breathed life into an old and potent idea, dating at least as far back as the ancient Romans. The idea of universal empire. It was this intoxicating elixir that fortified the Russian imperialists who conquered and colonized such a vast expanse of Eurasia. Whatever forests, swamps, deserts, or tundra landscapes stood in their path. Crossing the Ural Mountains and braving the lands of Siberia and the steppe, Russian conquerors, conquistadors, and Cossacks at last reached the seashores of the Baltics, Caucasus, and Far East their land empire straddling two great continents and two great oceans. The secret ingredient of this elixir was blood. 
It was copious amounts of blood, often Russian blood, that paid for Russian progress. Theirs was an empire always playing catch up with the more advanced, more civilized nations of Western Europe. Nations that were increasingly threatened by the Tsarist regime's relentless drive to close the gap, whatever the cost in Russian rubles or souls. Eventually, Western preconceptions about this empire's backwardness and barbarity had to be squared with figures like Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, and Tchaikovsky. But the arrival of these prodigies was engineered by a very different kind of genius. The genius of two imperial rulers, a czar and a czarina. The two greats of the Romanov period, Peter and Catherine. Catherine herself was not a Romanov, nor even a Russian. She was a German-born princess, originally named Sophie, who had married into the imperial family. Yet she consciously modeled herself after her predecessor Peter, while eschewing some of his worst tendencies. It was Peter who actually founded the Russian Empire decades prior, having cleared the path to an imperial crown after winning the Great Northern War, taking the title Emperor from the Latin Imperator and Autocrat from the Greek Autokrator. Peter Hellenized the medieval name of Rus as well, so that it became Russia, or Russia. Together, Peter and Catherine catapulted the fortunes of an interwoven family and people to new heights, transforming a backwater into a world power. It is a testament to their success that the Russians have only ever known one imperial dynasty to this day, the Romanovs. But there had been another family that came before them, a royal family that had been there almost from the beginning. It descended from a semi-legendary Scandinavian prince named Rurik, and it was his descendants, like Ivan the Great and Ivan the Terrible, that laid the foundations for the Russian Empire, which is why the first part of our story begins with them. The very name Rus, an Old Norse prefix for men who row, may have been a reference to the Viking origins of Rurik, who arrived in Novgorod by longboat as far back as the 9th century AD. His illustrious descendants, the so-called Rurikids, would adopt Christianity and split the realm between them piecemeal, just as their dubiously Germanic cousins, the Merovingians, had done in Francia a few hundred years prior. Closer to home, the city of Constantine loomed like a sentinel guarding the Black Sea's watery entrance, by all accounts one of the most impressive cities of the entire medieval period. Boasting the Hagia Sophia and encircled by the imposing Theodosian walls, Constantinople was not only the capital of the Byzantine Empire, but also the spiritual center of the inchoate Orthodox faith. It was at this time, around the close of the 10th century, that the Byzantine Greeks were ruled by the visionary emperor Basil the Bulgar Slayer, under whose leadership they broke precedent and offered an imperial bride to a barbarian ally. The happy groom was none other than Rurik's great-grandson, Vladimir the Great, who ruled from Kiev. Honoring the pledge he made to his new brother-in-law, Vladimir converted to Christianity and sent 6,000 fighting men to Constantinople, where they formed the core of the Varangian Guard, the Praetorians of the Middle Ages. To this day, the Eastern Orthodox Church is the primary Christian denomination of the Russians, Ukrainians, and Greeks alike. But the Rurikid Confederation would not be so tenable, and by the middle of the 13th century, this loose patchwork of principalities became prey to the single greatest Asiatic invasion in all of history. The Mongols had come, their conquests taking them further than the Scythians, Avars, and Huns alike. 
It was the Mongols who subjected the Russian people to one of their greatest traumas, two centuries of a humiliating, abject vassalage. Yet the Rurikids, born survivors, managed to adapt. Marrying into various Mongol clans, they continued administering their hereditary holdings. First on behalf of the Genghizid court at Karakorum, and then the court of the Golden Horde at Sarai. It was during this period that a new branch of the Rurikid family gained preeminence, the Muscovites, referred to as such because they administered the nascent city of Moscow, freshly rebuilt after the Mongols had burned it down. Over time, the Muscovites secured a position as the primary tax collectors of the Golden Horde, and by the late 15th century, they had accumulated enough wealth and favors to spearhead a coalition that would succeed in throwing off the yoke of their Tartar overlords. This victory had come only a few decades after the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks, and it meant that Moscow became the new center of the Eastern Orthodox faith, vaunted as a third Rome. This helps explain why the newly independent Muscovite prince, Ivan III, took the hand of the last Byzantine emperor's niece and styled himself Caesar, which was russified into Tsar. Ivan III would go down in history as Ivan the Great, passing the Muscovite throne to his grandson, Ivan IV, better known as Ivan the Terrible. According to Russia's foreign minister, he is the first of Putin's advisors. Ruling during the second half of the 16th century, Ivan the Terrible married and remarried six times like his contemporary, King Henry VIII of England, though Ivan's sadistic tendencies made Henry look like a saint. The first of Ivan's six wives had been a girl named Anastasia the winner of a bride show that he had organized in the manner of a Mongol Khan or Byzantine Emperor. Anastasia was Ivan's favorite wife, and her early death probably contributed to his descent into madness, which culminated in the senseless murder of the son they had together. On other occasions, there was a method to Ivan's madness. As with the terror campaign he waged against the Boyars, a medieval Russian landowning class with which he wrestled for control of the state. As part of this campaign, Ivan founded a 6,000 man secret police called the Oprichniki, prefiguring the Tsarist Okhrana and Soviet KGB. Descriptions of their activities would have made even Stalin proud, and by some accounts, they did. Dressed in black cloaks and riding black horses, the Oprichniki's mission was to sniff out treason and sweep it aside, which is why their saddles were festooned with rotting canine heads and brooms. They were Ivan's hellhounds, killing, maiming, quartering, burning, and impaling his political opponents with an unmatched ruthlessness. Sometimes, Ivan would join them on the hunt, and there are accounts of him hooting and hollering after crowding his victims, including women and children, into homes set ablaze or blown to smithereens using gunpowder newly imported from the east. His favorite form of execution involved running a hook through the ribs of his victims before stringing them up from somewhere on high. Yet for all the cruelty that placed him in the league of Vlad the Impaler, and the Viking practitioners of the Blood Eagle, Ivan the Terrible is relevant to our story because between his countless crimes and follies, he centralized power, conquered new lands, revised the legal code, and initiated the colonization of Siberia, marking the first recorded instance of Russian settlement beyond the Ural Mountains. That is why Ivan saw fit to take the title Tsar of All Russia, encompassing great, little, and White Russia, as well as the various Rurikid principalities that were now forged into one state and an increasingly centralized one.
but because he had accidentally killed his promising heir and namesake, after Ivan's death, the throne passed to his simple-minded younger son by Anastasia, Fyodor I. Known to history as the bell ringer, Fyodor's devoutness was the most notable thing about him, and he may have been enfeebled in mind and body due to congenital syphilis. Ultimately, Fyodor was the last czar of the House of Rurik, and his death on the cusp of the 17th century plunged Russia into the time of troubles. Such was the ignominious end of a dynasty founded almost a millennium ago. For all the travails this region's people had weathered during that span of time, none would compare to the next 15 years. The trauma sustained then would long remain in the bones of the Russian people, rocked as they were by famine, civil war, imposter claimants known as the False Dimitris, Cossack raids, and the invading armies of Sweden and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Something like a third of the Russian population was eviscerated, putting the crisis in the same league as those that took place in the 20th century. In 1613, Russia at last emerged from the troubles a small, ravaged, and bankrupt shell of its former self. Everything had to be rebuilt, from the state to the Kremlin Palace, bereft as it was of crown jewels and even utensils which had all been pawned off or looted. That is why the next Tsar, the 16-year-old Michael Romanov, can hardly be blamed for his reluctance to assume power. Yet for all his tearful protestations, the Russian boyars insisted on crowning this boy. There was nothing remarkable about him, but Michael was the first cousin once removed of the last Rurikid Tsar, Fyodor the Bellringer. As you will recall, Fyodor's mother, Anastasia, had been the unfortunate wife of Ivan the Terrible, and her father's name, Roman, is how the patronymic Romanov was minted. That, in a nutshell, is how Ivan the Terrible's lovely bride changed the destiny of her family and Russia forever. Though her relative Michael Romanov possessed no great gifts or even a will to rule, his reign was, all things considered, a largely successful one. Not only did he secure Russia's independence against the Poles, Lithuanians, and Swedes, it was during his reign that Russian explorers reached the eastern Siberian coast. Following Michael's death, his son, Alexei, inherited the throne. Known as the Young Monk, he put Russia back on the offensive. This Young Monk was quite a different man compared to his mild-mannered father. Fluent in Russian, Polish, and Latin, he possessed a fierce intelligence and at times resorted to physically or verbally reprimanding those who failed to carry out his orders. In addition to personally administering beatings, Alexei kept himself busy by composing poetry and studying the latest military technologies of the 17th century, all while overseeing the conquest of new territories including parts of Ukraine and Smolensk. By the time of Alexei's death, he left his scurvy-stricken heir, Fyodor, a Tsardom that spanned over 8 million square kilometers, or 3 million square miles. Because of the scurvy, Fyodor's reign would be a short one. Dead at 20, the throne now passed to his brothers, who, it was decided, would be co-rulers because the elder of the two was sickly and simple-minded. The brothers' names were Ivan V and Peter, Ivan was the elder brother of the two, but because of his aforementioned afflictions, he was effectively ruled by the pair's sister, who whispered instructions into his ear through a peephole located behind the throne. Peter, meanwhile, was a precocious boy, already tall for his age. Ivan and Peter's sister, Sophia, was effectively Russia's first female ruler. At a time when Russian noblewomen were veiled and mostly confined to their living quarters, Sophia was a liberated woman, known as the Great Sovereign Lady. This was no accident of history, for Sophia fought tooth and nail to maintain her hold on power. When it seemed certain that Ivan V would be passed over by the aristocracy, 
and sole rulership of Russia handed to her younger brother, Peter. Sophia incited the Streltsy to revolt. The Streltsy were members of a military and social unit of society whose origins could be traced back to Ivan the Terrible's standing army, the first in Russian history. In a series of events that traumatized the 10-year-old Peter for the rest of his life, the Streltsy burst into the Kremlin and murdered several of the boy's relatives and friends, parading their chopped up remains around the palace and mockingly announcing who each piece of flesh had once belonged to. Eventually, Peter would have his revenge. By the time he was 17, he and his allies outmaneuvered Sophia and forced her to retire to a convent. This after Peter narrowly escaped the clutches of the Streltsy yet again. One day, after yet another failed Streltsy uprising, Peter had the perpetrators summarily tortured and killed, hanging some of their corpses near his sister's convent as a warning to her. Meanwhile, Peter's harmless brother, Ivan, was allowed to remain co-ruler until his death in 1696, at which point Peter's sole rule began. Standing six feet, eight inches tall, the equivalent of two meters, Peter was, in every way, a giant of Russian history, and the first great ruler that the Romanov dynasty produced. An apt personification of Russia itself, he was impossible to ignore, all the more so because of his incessant facial tics. Peter harbored an overactive imagination and boundless reservoirs of energy, insisting on seeing and doing everything for himself. At times, he suffered from night terrors, and his vitality could, on occasion, overflow into something resembling an epileptic fit, possibly a response to his traumatic boyhood memories. These mental and physical trials notwithstanding, Peter's gifts were such that he packed centuries of reform into mere decades. He dreamed of a modern Russia, with no boyars or Streltsy or other relics of the Rurik had passed, and for the entirety of his reign, Peter worked tirelessly to make that dream come true. He built the navy from scratch, reformed and modernized the army, introduced new military uniforms and gun designs, established artillery schools, and organized the Preobrazhensky Guard, the Romanov's very own version of the Praetorian Guard. An inveterate micromanager, the mechanically-minded Peter drew up gun and mortar diagrams, studied shipbuilding under the finest masters of Europe, and insisted on rising through the naval service like any other soldier, beginning with the humble rank of bombardier and finally reaching the rank of admiral after 26 years of service. Though not a scholarly type himself, much more comfortable with a hammer than a book in his hands, Peter frequently lamented his lack of a formal education and sincerely believed in its importance. He standardized spelling in the civil script, introduced the first newspaper, opened the first university, and founded the Russian Academy of Sciences, today a network of over 1,000 institutions employing tens of thousands of scientific researchers. But perhaps the finest testament to Peter's memory is the city of St. Petersburg, today the second most populous city in Russia. In his magisterial book about Russian history, the scholar Orlando Figes wrote that, like the magic city of a Russian fairy tale, St. Petersburg grew with such fantastic speed, and everything about it was so brilliant and new that it soon became enshrined in myth. Though unlike other myths, we have detailed records of Peter's intense involvement in the city's construction. By hook or by crook, he transformed what had been a disease-ridden swampland into a modern and bustling city that connected Russia and its growing fleet to the Baltic Sea. This came at the cost of 30,000 Russian lives, cut short by malaria, scurvy, and dysentery, the latter of which seems to have prompted Peter to threaten those who defecated outside his lavatories 
with cat o' nine tail whippings. Peter was a staunch opponent of the perennial Russian problem of corruption and a proponent of meritocracy. As he saw it, determined, talented officials could help him close the distance with Western Europe. Toward that end, Peter attracted foreigners with a wide variety of skill sets to his court, and they were made to feel more at home by his importation of the latest Western fashions. Most famously, Peter shaved his beard, hoping to inspire other Russians to do the same. When it became clear that not everyone was on board, you can imagine how shocking it might have been when Peter resorted to forcefully shaving other men's beards for them. Peter was not afraid to roll up his sleeves and get things done himself. An avowed student of human anatomy, when his entourage complained about toothaches, he was known to pull their teeth out himself. Yet Peter's interests and enthusiasms had a dark side, and he would on occasion personally administer beatings, executions, and torture sessions. There had even come one occasion when Peter held up the decapitated head of his former mistress after her execution, and began lecturing the assembled audience about its anatomy. His father, Alexei, the young monk, had displayed similar tendencies as you will recall, but Peter dialed these up a thousandfold. For most of Russian history, being great and being terrible were two sides of the same coin. Like Ivan the Terrible, Peter the Great was a filicide. Regarding his son as a disappointment and traitor, he repeatedly compared him to a gangrenous thumb before having him tortured to death. In the authoritative book about the Romanov family, the historian Simon Seabag Montefiore claims that Peter the Great understood that autocracy required tireless checking and threatening. Such were and are the perils of ruling this colossal state while presiding over a personal despotism without clear rules or limits that it is often futile to accuse Russian rulers of paranoia. Extreme vigilance, backed by sudden violence, was and is their natural and essential state. If anything, they suffer from Emperor Domitian's witty complaint shortly before his own assassination that the lot of princes is most unhappy, since when they denounced a conspiracy, no one believed them until they had been assassinated. But fear alone was not enough. Even after killing millions, Stalin grumbled that still no one obeyed him. Autocracy is not as easy as you think, said the supremely intelligent Catherine. Unlimited power was a chimera. Though the unbridled exercise of autocracy may indeed be chimerical, Peter the Great made it more real than it ever had been, devoting mind, body, and soul to advance Russia's place in the world. We have come from the darkness out into the light, Peter had written his ill-fated son. Before, no one in the world knew us, but now they must respect us. By the time of Peter's death, Russia had weathered long and punishing wars against its longtime enemies, the Ottoman Turks and the Swedes. The latter conflict was known as the Great Northern War, and besides marking the end of one empire and the beginning of another, it is notable because it prefigured the existential clashes that Russia faced in the 19th and 20th centuries. Each of these fights for survival ended the exact same way. With their backs to the wall, the Russians outlasted, outbled, and outspent their opponents, ultimately coming out stronger than before. After Peter the Great, the imperial throne briefly passed to his second wife, Catherine I, whose rise to power from lowborn camp follower to empress was a sign of how much times had changed. But this is not the Catherine you're thinking of. That Catherine, the Great One, hadn't even been born yet. By the time Catherine the Great ascended to the throne, Russia had become somewhat used to the idea of female rule. It had experienced the regency of Peter the Great's sister, Sophia, the short-lived reign of his widowed wife, Empress Catherine I, then the scandalous rule of his niece, Empress Anna, and finally, the enlightened and benevolent rule of his daughter, Empress Elizabeth. 
This was not, however, an orderly or unbroken succession of Tsarinas. There had been two interludes when a boy Tsar briefly reigned, first Peter II and then Ivan VI, though it would not be until Peter III that a man was back in charge of Russia. Peter III was the grandson of Peter the Great, yet he was uniquely unfit for the reins of power and singularly unworthy to be his predecessor's namesake. His mother was Peter the Great's eldest daughter, and she had married into a German family based in Holstein. It was there that Peter III was born, his mother and father both dead by the time he was 11 years old. Not long after that, this German-born Romanov princeling was summoned to the mother country, where, after the death of the Empress, he inherited the Russian throne. Hardly speaking a word of Russian, and idolizing Frederick the Great, the warrior king of Prussia, Peter III is mostly remembered for switching sides in the Seven Years' War. In doing so, he single-handedly changed its outcome, allowing Prussia to bounce back in what became called the miracle of the House of Brandenburg. His reign lasted only six months, cut short by a coup instigated by his German-born wife, Catherine. It is this Catherine that would be remembered as great, something evident from the very moment that she seized power. When Peter III caught on to what was happening, he burst into Catherine's bedroom only to find her missing, an abandoned dress laid across the bed in her absence. At the sight of this, the panicked emperor declared to his courtiers, didn't I tell you she was capable of anything? In the book that we quoted from earlier about the Romanov family, it is written that Catherine, dressed raffishly in her guard's uniform and holding a naked saber, emerged into Palace Square in St. Petersburg, mounted her great thoroughbred Brilliant, and reviewed the 12,000 guards waiting for her. It was then that she realized her saber was missing its sword knot, and, in an age when such things matter, that sharp young horse guard sergeant Potemkin galloped up and offered her his. It would be the beginning of one of history's greatest love affairs, and also one of its most successful political partnerships. Potemkin and Catherine would lead Russia into a golden age, their correspondence a combination of flowery professions of love and matters of state, often packed into the same letter. As for poor old Peter III, he would be confined to a countryside estate, where it seems he was strangled to death by one of Catherine's lovers. The autopsy, which identified hemorrhoids as Peter's cause of death, became a joke across Europe overnight. Fluent in Russian and steeped in the culture's customs and history, Catherine was nonetheless a reformer and modernizer, and a great patron of the arts and education. Like Peter the Great, she had an eye for talent, though good looks could get her attention too. With her favorite, Potemkin, Catherine founded cities like Mariupol, Odessa, Kherson, and Sevastopol, today the battlegrounds of the war in Ukraine. She also colonized Alaska and founded a number of universities and boarding schools, including the first to let girls in. Catherine read everything and corresponded with the leading lights of Europe at the time, like Pushkin, Voltaire, and Diderot. To the latter, she wrote about the reality of autocratic power, saying that while he wrote on unfeeling paper, she wrote on human skin, which is sensitive to the slightest touch. In short, Catherine was the very picture of an enlightened despot, a byword for rationalism, secularism, and progress, but she also had a ruthless side. Faced with enemies within and without, Catherine seized parts of the Caucasus, Crimea, Ukraine, and Poland, adding some 520,000 square kilometers, or 200,000 square miles, to the Russian Empire. This while crushing a series of revolts that culminated in the Cossack Rebellion. The Cossacks were a semi-nomadic, Eastern Orthodox people of mixed ethnic ancestry, whose name had come from the Turkic Kazakh, meaning freebooter. They were to be found in eastern Ukraine and southern Russia, and their spirit of rugged individualism is evident from the fact that they elected their own leaders called hetmen. 
Tens of thousands of Cossacks and serfs alike died resisting Catherine the Great. In her time, the Russian system of serfdom had evolved into a form of raceless slavery, with serfs making up a substantial portion of the population and referred to as souls. This made it different from the feudal forms of serfdom characteristic of medieval Europe, under which serfs were not legally bound to the land that they toiled on. Although Catherine had been interested in reforming this system, she also didn't want to risk losing her throne so she kept the system intact as a concession to the nobility. As she herself would say, autocracy is not as easy as you think. But unlike her predecessors Ivan the Terrible and Peter the Great, Catherine never went out of her way to be cruel, and yet she worried all the same about what posterity would make of her, convinced that she would never be forgiven for presiding over her unpopular husband's murder. Today it seems that posterity has not only forgiven, but also forgotten all about that sordid affair. Instead, it has chosen to remember a vicious rumor about Catherine having an affair with a horse, perhaps the most successful example of British propaganda besides what it did to Napoleon's reputation. After Catherine, the imperial throne passed to her son Paul. Although it would be claimed by Catherine herself that Paul had been fathered by one of her lovers and not Peter III, he would at every turn prove himself his father's son. Charmless and unpopular, he was also murdered by someone close to him, not by a wife, but by a son, Alexander I. Naively, Alexander thought that he could overthrow his father and spare his life but his co-conspirators took matters into their own hands, as may have been the case with Catherine's plot as well. In one of the most gruesome regicides in Russian history, Paul was strangled, stabbed, and trampled to death, a murder that would haunt his son, Alexander, for the rest of his days. Yet, as with his grandmother Catherine, Alexander would be forgiven. Curiously, it was Catherine who had chosen Alexander's name on behalf of his parents, his brother Constantine also being named by her. This was part of Catherine's Greek project, the uniquely Russian answer to the so-called Eastern question. As all of Europe watched the Ottoman Empire wither away from afar, the Romanovs dreamed of seizing Constantinople, an ambition that would linger long after Alexander was gone. In the meantime, the gifted but inscrutable new Tsar would have his attention diverted elsewhere to the defense of his empire in the wake of Napoleon's ill-fated invasion. 250,000 Russians were pitted against a multinational, multi-ethnic coalition of 615,000, spearheaded by perhaps the greatest general in history, Napoleon. It was the largest invasion in history up to that point, surpassed only when the Germans invaded a century later. The recurrent nightmare of the Russian people, with their lack of natural borders and deep-seated insecurities about encirclement, had now come to life once again. Yet the military genius of Napoleon, which hinged on outmarching and outforaging whoever he was up against, was neutralized by an adversary refusing to play on his terms. After Moscow was taken by his troops, Napoleon had expected the Russians to give in. Instead, they set their former capital ablaze so that their enemy couldn't winter there. What a people, Napoleon was set to declare, comparing them to the Scythians of old. as many Napoleonic soldiers would die marching toward Moscow as retreating from it. All told, 40% of Napoleonic losses came from Russian regular military action, like at the Battle of Borodino, and the remaining 60% came from exposure, disease, starvation, and partisan action. These numbers belie the popularly held belief that the Russian winter had made the outcome inevitable. In truth, there was nothing inevitable about it. Napoleon had read Voltaire's history of the Great Northern War, 
and knew all about the Russian winter. But he was faced with an enemy whose defiance was encapsulated by the Tsar himself, who vowed that he would sooner let his beard grow to the waist and eat potatoes in Siberia than give in. Just as important as its defiance was the Empire's ability to adapt, adopting a policy of Fabian withdrawal into the Russian interior after Kutuzov was named General-in-Chief. With the fulfillment of Napoleon's first rule for the art of war, a unified command, the Russians adopted the corps and divisional system, codified the army command, revamped the staff structure, reorganized the distribution of rations, instituted a war ministry, and kept military factories open over time. In the end, Tsar Alexander would chase Napoleon all the way to Paris, where he arrived at the head of a triumphant Russian army. When in 1945 an American ambassador asked Stalin how he was feeling after the fall of Berlin, he laconically remarked that Tsar Alexander had made it all the way to Paris. The remark is all the more apt because, like Tsar Alexander, Stalin had outspent and outbled his enemies to victory. When the rosy glow of his fresh triumph had faded, Alexander was left accounting for the war. Hundreds of thousands of Russians had perished, and the empire's national debt increased thirteenfold. How can a single man manage to govern Russia and correct its abuses, he asked despairingly. This would be impossible not only for a man of ordinary abilities like me, but even for a genius. After Alexander's death, no more genius czars or tsarinas would save the Russian Empire from its impending doom. Although each of the czars who succeeded him took their sacred role seriously, none of them managed to close the yawning gap between East and West. Now reopened in the wake of the Industrial Revolution, all of this was already becoming clear in the mid-19th century with the outbreak of the Crimean War. Another expensive lesson paid for with half a million Russian lives. This was a conflict photographed and telegraphed, waged with railroads and naval shells. Like the American Civil War was to reaffirm in the succeeding decade, game had changed once again. By the time the last Tsar, Nicholas II, took power, it is doubtful whether even the greats could have reversed the irresistible tide of history. To an even greater extent than his father, the reactionary Alexander III, Nicholas was partial toward the Russian peasantry, wary of foreign and aristocratic influence, and keen to represent himself as the leader of a pan-Slavic movement. Insisting on wielding the levers of power for himself, he lacked the deft touch of a Peter or Catherine, blundering into both the Russo-Japanese War and World War I. The first of these conflicts occasioned what Vladimir Lenin referred to as the great dress rehearsal for the October Revolution. As with the popular uprisings of the past, the Russian Revolution of 1905 was defeated. Before the October Revolution, unpopular czars were usually dispatched via murder and never via revolt. Shut out from the Kremlin's palace intrigues, the Russian masses watch czars and tsarinas come and go, resigned to lives of perpetual toil and all too frequent bloodletting. But with the dawn of the 20th century, the Russian masses eagerly imbibed the revolutionary ideas that had swept Western Europe in the preceding century. By 1917, the First World War provided the Bolsheviks with the cover necessary to mount a second revolution brutally putting an end to over three centuries of Romanov rule. On Lenin's orders, the Bolsheviks captured Tsar Nicholas II and his photogenic family, all of whom, even the children, were bayoneted and shot to death. After the ensuing Russian Civil War, which claimed millions, the Bolshevik victory was complete and Marxism-Leninism replaced sacred autocracy as the state's ruling doctrine. Not long after that, Stalin took power, 
and Marxism-Leninism metastasized into its most vicious form, subjecting Russians and other peoples under their orbit to one of the most genocidal, oppressive regimes in history. Despite that, Stalin arguably succeeded where the last Tsars had failed, leaving behind an industrialized nuclear superpower that emerged victorious from a world war that threatened its very existence. Yet in absolute terms, the human cost was far greater than any incurred in the long history of the Russian Empire. More than any ruler in Russian history, or maybe all of history, Stalin came closest to the chimera of absolute power. The Soviet Union was no mere autocracy, but a full-blown totalitarian state, distinct from past regimes in its concerted attempt to control not only what people do, but also what they thought. Though Stalin was a true believer in communism, approaching this all-encompassing ideology with the reverence of a religious fanatic, it is also evident that he saw himself as a red czar, knowing that in Russia, the terrible and the great were two sides of the same coin. If there is one comparison to be observed between Stalin and Putin, two very different men living in very different times, it is their myopic understanding of Russian history as one long succession of good czars and bad czars, the litmus test being strength whether a czar left behind a Russia that was stronger or weaker than before. Both would likely agree, the good czars were the two Ivans, Peter and Catherine, while the bad ones were Fyodor I and Nicholas II, among others. The concerning thing about all this is that, if I had to guess, Putin would probably add Stalin to the list of good czars and Gorbachev to the list of bad ones. After all, if he idolizes Ivan the Terrible, then perhaps he idolizes Stalin too. If Ivan had been the General Secretary of the Soviet Union instead of Stalin, then how different would things really have been in the 20th century? I don't know the answers to these questions, nor do I claim to know what the future holds. But if there's one thing I'm certain about, it's that we should be thinking about the Russian Empire if only because its newest czar is determined to be a good one. Uh, I'll answer the question. I looked the man in the eye. I found it to be very straightforward and trustworthy. Uh, we had a very good dialogue. I was able to um, get a sense of his soul. He's a man deeply committed to his country and the best interests of his country. Uh, and I appreciate it so very much, the frank dialogue. Some people would say that the idea that uh, Ukraine might become a member of NATO is what propelled Putin forward in this invasion. Yeah, they had looked in his eyes and seen his soul, you know. Uh, he, 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 this is an empire builder. It has nothing to do, it's a convenient excuse.